Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about updates to the ATX 12 volt only spec, or ATX 12VO and ATX 3.0 as well. We'll also be going over some new rumors for NVIDIA's ADA GPUs that are coming up. That'll be the RTX 4000 series. There's already been a Hopper announcement, which is the data center and science side of NVIDIA's architecture, and ADA Lovelace GPUs are approaching, so that's next. Prime Computer is another laptop manufacturer joining in the modular laptop revolution, as it were. That framework has largely inspired, and companies like Dell have scrambled to jump on board the train, going, no, wait, we, we also have ideas like this. We're still relevant. And we'll be going over a couple of oddities, like the TeamForce SSD plus CPU cooling solution. Before that, this video is brought to you by CableMod's PCIe 4.0 riser cables, available in 90 degree and straight connections. The PCIe Gen 4 riser cables run up to 30 centimeters long and pair well with CableMod's vertical GPU brackets, designed to maintain a more optimal distance between the video card fans and the case side panel. CableMod markets that these have full speed signal transmission because they use a pure copper tinning process to achieve better signal quality. Learn more at the link in the description below. A couple quick updates before we get started. So on Artesian Builds, that saga, that timeline, we still have one more piece coming that's really interesting as we've dug into things sort of post-collapse of Artesian Builds. Uh, but one quick update there for now is that we've just sent out an email to the potential employers who are looking for employees who would fit the skill set that the Artesian Builds team had. So Artesian had a lot of really high skilled employees working there, people who wanted to build great computers and were just ultimately sort of sabotaged by, it looks like, the CEO at this point. So we did collect the information from as many people as we could who reached out from Artesian. If you reached out, you're very likely in that list of uh, people we've sent out to companies like iBuyPower, Intel, actually someone from there emailed us. We had contact from Main Gear CEO, from V1 Tech, from Power GPU, from Asus. So a lot of really big names in there looking to get some talent that used to work at Artesian. So hopefully a, a good outcome for people who are in an unfortunate situation. Uh, we obviously don't control the hiring process, but can at least connect people to some of the hiring managers at those companies. So uh, we'll see where that goes, and, and obviously we've got a follow-up coming up. Now, second story, we've been manufacturing our toolkits for several years now, that's this one here, and we're excited to announce our first massive warranty policy we're offering. We've had warranty policies in the past, like for the Mod Mods, but as a smaller company that's been learning the manufacturing ins and outs, this is our first major warranty. So we are retroactively adding a seven-year warranty to the toolkits. Really excited about this and proud of the quality we've had. So uh, this is something, you know, I've seen what companies like Noctua and Arctic have done where when they introduce a new policy, they, they feel pretty good about the quality of their new product line. Uh, they typically do a retroactive addition of their warranty or extension of it. And we've always given that a lot of credit as we've covered it. It's an awesome way to sort of say to early customers, hey, thank you for supporting us and getting us off the ground. We're going to let you benefit from this too and not just future customers. So we are sort of following in their footsteps for what they do with coolers. We want to do that for our own stuff. And that's why we're retroactively adding the seven-year warranty for the 10-piece GN teardown toolkit that you can get on store.gamersnexus.net. And of course, that applies to future orders as well. So you can read the specific policy on the GN store page if you want to learn what's covered, uh, if you already have one or you're buying one. The toolkit has 10 specifically built and custom tuned tools by our team for GPU disassembly, water block installation, PC building, uh, and it includes things like special ground down hex heads to accommodate small FE sized screws where you need a lot of clearance around SMDs and capacitors on PCBs. So this is just kind of a continuation of our focus on quality. Personally, this is what I look for when I review products, and we want to make things that last a really long time. That's why the mod mats are as rugged as they are. We've been selling these for years now. And in my personal viewpoint on it, not just economically as an end user does it make sense if you can to buy something that'll last a long time because you're not replacing it as much, but also just better environmentally uh, to kind of get it all done at once and you have something that lasts a very long time. And we're confident in these and we've been making them a while now with great results. So that's why we're doing this. So as we've continued to engineer the tools, we've made gradual improvements and refinements to the specific chemical mixture for the metals. 
We've added aggressive salt spray testing for longevity and aging simulation. And we're even adding a small series of videos giving tips on our GN Extras channel. So we've included some FAQ, like people will sometimes ask, hey, I've had the toolkit for a couple of years now. How do I remagnetize the driver or add additional strength to the magnetism? So we've got a, a couple of small videos going up over there if you want to check them out. Uh, anyway, if you don't have a toolkit yet, you want to support our work and get something that will help you and your PC endeavors in return, you can go to store.cameraxis.net to grab it. And they're in stock and shipping now. And again, if you already have one, this policy applies to you too. Uh, check it out on the store. You can learn how to contact us properly to get to the right person if you need to ever make use of that policy. And huge thank you for supporting us and making us what we are today, uh, helping us afford the testing equipment we get, all that stuff. Okay, first major story is a rumor, actually. This is the Hardware Info website listing NVIDIA's Ada Lovelace GPUs in an upcoming update. So this helps to sort of confirm or cement the rumors that are already out there that yes, the RTX 4000 series is in fact on its way. In the upcoming changes section of the version history page for Hardware Info's popular diagnostic monitoring tool, several new GPUs from NVIDIA are being listed, some of which appear to be from the upcoming consumer-focused Ada architecture. The newly added GPUs were listed as follows. NVIDIA GH100, GH202, just jump in here. Those are the Hopper GPUs. That would be what the H stands for. There's AD102, AD103, 104, 106, 107. Those are going to be the ADA, or what was formerly called the Lovelace GPUs. There's the GB100 and GB102 as well. And it's also worth mentioning that the only official GPU in the list is that GH100, which is NVIDIA's most recently announced at GTC 2022. These names also correspond with what was leaked in that massive lapsus leak previously. So we'd assume the names at this point are legitimate, basically finalized. Uh, that doesn't mean NVIDIA's plans are set in stone, but the naming convention follows how they're all named, where you'll typically, if you're not familiar, you'll see the larger of the dies start at the 100 or the 200 number, and the smaller ones or the cut down ones get listed after that. So you get up to 106 or uh, something along those lines. You're sort of in the previously like a 60 territory, 50 territory, maybe a 70, depending on the architectural generation, as opposed to the highest end one where you're at a, a 102 or 104 or something. Next one is the Intel Core i9-12900KS. This is a CPU that is $800. It follows up the Alder Lake i9-12900K, no S. Big surprise. The K stands for unlocked in Intel CPUs, overclockable, highest end SKU of that particular family, so the i9 here. And then the S indicates it's a special edition. Intel hasn't launched many of these to memory. The 9900KS is the most recent one, pretty sure. Uh, so this is another in that line. They are more expensive. They're specially binned versions of the existing CPU. So at a purely hardware level, silicon level, you're not getting anything different, but they're clocked higher, or at least this one is, and you might have more overclocking headroom there as well, though it's not necessarily guaranteed. Anyway, Intel, uh, as expected, is launching this at a higher price. Newegg blundered and <laughs> accidentally released the 12900KS early, um, recalled all of the shipments, and pulled the Newegg, basically, but they were selling them for $800. The Intel MSRP as Intel lists it is 739, but Intel lists its pricing as per 1,000 units. So it's basically wholesale pricing. So 800 is about what makes sense when the retailer makes their own money on top of it. As expected, the key differences between the 12900K and the 12900KS are in the base and boost clocks. While the K-SKU ships with a base or boost of 3.2 gigahertz and 5.1 respectively, or 5.2 with thermal velocity boost, the KS SKU will ship with a base or boost of 3.4 and 5.2 gigahertz. Furthermore, the i9-12900KS tops out at, theoretically, 5.5 gigahertz boost. That's presumably via Intel's ETVB, or Enhanced Thermal Velocity Boost. In other words, you shouldn't expect to see that 5.5 number much uh, or at all, depending on your cooling solution and how many threads are under load. But the official listed number here is a, a 5.2 gigahertz, basically 100 megahertz increment for boost and a little bit more for base and then possibility for more beyond that depending on the condition. So elsewhere, much as the same, the KSQ, it's still an eight plus eight configuration. That's eight P cores, eight E cores. Um, it's configured exactly the same way. It's got the same split of P and E cores. The E cores boost a little higher as well. So they've gotten a 100 megahertz 
update here in the E core frequency uh, and for base and, and boost for that. And Intel's UHD Graphics 770 is still the IGP that is included in this version of the 12900 case. So that has not changed either. No doubt Intel here is trying to head off and these upcoming R7 5800X 3D, the version of the 5800X that has a veritable dumpster truck of cache on top of it. Uh, and that's supposed to be coming up soon. That's L3V cache uh, where they've done the direct copper bonding stacked additional cache module on top of the CPU while retaining the same Z height. You've seen us talk about that before. So the chip is set for an April 20th arrival. So Intel will at least have a little bit of time to boast depending on how AMD's uh, launch shakes up when the 5800X 3D comes out. Up next, this is a story all about how and Ooh, maybe a bad reference right now. There's a story about NVIDIA, Intel, and maybe AMD working together uh, as their lives are flipped upside down with the super sampling revolution. NVIDIA and Intel recently announced that they're collaborating on building an SDK for game developers to implement any form of super sampling technology into games under one inclusive deployment solution. The new SDK is called Streamline, and it's theoretically a relatively vendor agnostic open source development kit that is capable of adding DLSS, XESS, that's Intel's by the way, or FSR, AMD's to games, or as NVIDIA's diagram phrases it, quote, NVIDIA plugins, Intel plugins, and hardware vendor number three. Wonder who that could be. It's, they should have like a, a name that CEO, like a name that Pokemon, except it's just an outline, it's a silhouette of Dr. Lisa Sue from AMD. So uh, obviously AMD is hardware vendor number three. This is probably an instance where, you know, FSR is open source. So probably NVIDIA doesn't need AMD to authorize the inclusion in Streamline. Likely uh, AMD has not responded directly to NVIDIA about this, even though Intel has. Intel actually provided a statement saying that they're looking forward to working with NVIDIA on this. But AMD is more of a direct competitor and so it makes a little more sense that they didn't authorize their logo to be included on NVIDIA slide. Anyway, the aim is to address the growing issue of having all these different super sampling technologies uh, or technologies that help to make cards more able to run games at higher graphics quality by sort of shaving some off of the resolution requirement that we typically see for computing power. So Streamline sits between a 3D application and the render API, that'd be DirectX or Vulkan. Game developers pipe standard information from the game to Streamline. And that standard information would be things like motion vectors or depth. And then Streamline does platform appropriate upscaling and then the frame is rendered out as usual. Developers can still choose to integrate upscaling methods the old fashioned way. That would be individually, so one by one. Uh, but on paper at least, Streamline is meant to be a streamlined solution that's sort of one and done and should make it easier for developers. This is a common problem we've seen over decades now, but as uh, graphics companies have added technology options, that in theory are deployable per game and these software development kits, game developers have had to struggle with, is it really worth the time to, even if it's sort of all packaged, we still have to validate it. We still have to build two versions of perhaps these models or assets or whatever uh, in case the user has, it, has the technology on or has it off. So it's always been a challenge to get stuff to actually be implemented, even if the technology is cool. This is supposed to be solving that. We'll see how it goes, obviously, as things advance. But to be clear, Streamline is not another DLSS. It's not XESS. It's not FSR. It is a box to put those things in to then make them easier to deploy. That's the idea. So it's not a super sampling technology itself, and it's not competing with AMD's uh, FSR, or Radeon Super Resolution, uh, or other existing technologies like XESS, which is coming out, but not here yet. And as a reminder, RSR is the driver level feature that we covered about a week or two now uh, ago, if you want to check that out. As for why NVIDIA would do this, you know, we always look at this type of thing where one company is sort of supporting directly or indirectly its competitors. And there's, you could look at it in the most cynical possible way. You could look at it in a more neutral way. We'll give you kind of both takes on this. So we would assume two things. NVIDIA probably has the most to gain here by offering this SDK, even if its competitors are included. Uh, because right now, if a developer only has time to implement one upscaling method and developers are notoriously constrained on time, then it should be the most universally compatible method rather than one that is more restricted or perhaps takes more time or validation to implement. An FSR would be the most universally compatible rather than DLSS. 
So that's perhaps a reason on the cynical side. By sticking all the upscaling methods into one box as well, NVIDIA may be able to boost the adoption of DLSS. So that would benefit it, even if it also gets its competitors widespread use. Uh, on the more neutral side, NVIDIA already has the largest market share for consumer GPUs. So they probably don't really feel all that threatened. And likely NVIDIA also feels pretty confident in how DLSS looks. So maybe they just want to facilitate uh, the, the inclusion of everyone so that there's more comparison against NVIDIA. So that would be our sort of analysis of it. Streamline is available as an SDK on NVIDIA's website at this point, and, and actually is available on GitHub too, in a repository since March 19th. DX11 and DX12 are both supported. They claim Vulkan is on the list as well. If this makes it easier for devs to add these technologies, that'd be a good thing. We'd be happy to cover it. Um, this kind of stuff, you know, it's always, there's a little bit of that old XKCD comic of there's so many standards, we need to introduce a new standard. Now there's so many standards plus one. So uh, this isn't a super sampling technology, so it should dodge some of that, but it does come down to game developers to actually use it. We'll follow up on this uh, as it potentially gets used and let you know what happens. All right, Prime Computer up next. This one joins the modular laptop uh, scene where Prime Computer has announced its take on modular laptops. This one, it is calling the Primebook Circular. It's a hell of a name. We've got to be careful of that Apple trademark where you know, the circle's kind of close to an Apple. It, it could be perceived as a threat. Apple doesn't respond well to those. Well, it responds very litigiously. Of course, if Prime Computer ever makes a phone, it'll also have to be very careful of rounded corners on those phones. Those are, those are special. Not just anyone can innovate a rounded corner. Prime Computer's Primebook Circular comes hot on the heels of Frameworks laptop entering the market and seems to be another option in a still early modular laptop market. As a reminder, Dell also followed in Frameworks' success and introduced its own concept of a modular laptop. Not an actual one, just an idea of one. So it hasn't announced concrete plans yet. While Prime Computer hasn't explicitly confirmed this aspect of the news, it would appear that the Primebook Circular would be very well uh, suited as a branded version of the Intel NUC P14e Whitebook laptop design. This is a point that Tom's Hardware brings up in its own write-up. And furthermore, a YouTube video by Prime Computer detailing its circular modularity concept all but confirms the new devices are using Intel's NUC 11 compute elements. That said, the Primebook Circular can be configured with modules containing a Celeron 6305 going up to a Core i7 1165G7. Just a sort of reminder for Intel here while we're talking about it, uh, probably you shouldn't put your, your passwords in the product names, you know, like i7 1165G7. Keep that to a sticky note on the monitor or something. The modules themselves can be had with varying amounts of RAM, depending on which CPU users select, ranging between 4 and 16 gigabytes. All the modules contain Intel's Wi-Fi 6 AX201 and Bluetooth 5.2 as well. Prime Computer is also working on a program where users can sell back their compute modules to Prime Computer, and they'll be repurposed for other devices. This would actually be really cool to see. Right now, you have options to get rid of your old hardware, uh, but you have to sort of seek out often charity organizations that will figure out how to repurpose it. Uh, Cramden Institute is an awesome example of this, by the way, where they'll repurpose things for education, for use in schools for kids, or for adults who just can't afford computers. So there is that option, but a company doing a direct buyback is pretty interesting. So um, this is coming up. They have claims about doing some sort of carbon offset. We haven't looked into that too closely to determine exactly what that means, but uh, it looks like modular laptops are becoming a thing, finally. Never really thought that would happen. Up next, Team Group. Team Group is expanding its line of Siren AIO liquid coolers to include what the company is calling a first, a liquid cooler with tandem CPU and SSD cooling, replete with ARGB lighting, because of course. While SSD cooling with PCIe Gen 4 devices and potentially Gen 5 has become more important, a uh, quick reminder here, the SSDs, so flash memory, the NAND, does sort of like to be run hotter when it's running. So it doesn't actually benefit from running cooler. In fact, if you were to, let's say, extreme cool the flash memory, maybe you run the computer in a zero degree Celsius environment, you are reducing the life of that flash, not improving it. The controller is the part that benefits from being cooled directly, not the NAND. Um, so, and, and we'll see how that changes, but just generally as a technology, flash memory, 
does benefit from being warmer when it's under operation specifically. And the controller benefits from being cooler. That's why it's been kind of challenging to figure out the balance because you got one thing with all these modules on it. It's kind of hard to cool one aspect of it, but not all of it, and vice versa. All right, so while Team Group was light on the details here in its press release, the company notes that the AIOs will support a large array of Intel and AMD sockets that are relevant right now, including LGA 1700 and AM4 sockets, and the upcoming AM5 socket. The water block for the SSD is also designed for the M.2 2280 form factor. That's the larger of them. And the press release shows one image with what appears to be a CPU pump block and the accompanying M.2 block uh, combo. Up next, some news on ATX 12VO standards. We covered ATX 12VO probably about two years ago now. That video is still relevant. All the core information you need to know is in there. You can check it out if you haven't seen it yet. But ATX 12VO, as the name suggests, is 12 volts only. And it is an Intel spec, but Intel also made the ATX spec for modern power supplies. So it doesn't mean that others can't use it. They just happen to be the company behind engineering it. So in the wake of these increasingly power-hungry GPUs, like the 3090 Ti that we tested at 500 watts, of board level power consumption, Intel has both overhauled its ATX power supply specification, the standard one, and the ATX 12VO specification. So ATX 12VO is now on version 2, not to be confused with ATX, which is on version 3 now. While ATX as a spec has been around for years, Intel's 12VO is still fairly new and was launched back in 2020. With future graphics cards potentially approaching the 600 watt mark and the upcoming PCIe 5.0 interface, Things are changing fast for power supplies and they need to be designed to cope with it. ATX 12VO V2 is largely a subset of the original or overall ATX 3.0 spec. But as we've talked about in the past, not everything from 12VO is necessarily applicable to just the ATX spec and vice versa. Some of the biggest changes to ATX 3.0 are that it's being built around PCIe Gen 5. So there's new energy efficiency targets, for example, particularly regarding power at idle. And things like the new 12 plus 4 pin, uh, 12 VH power connector are new as well. You can actually see this on the end of that 3090 Ti FTW3 we reviewed, where it's got the 12 pin connector, and under it there's four more pins that could optionally be connected, although um, the connector we were sent for does not include those. So that's what we're talking about there. Now the new 12 VH power connector should power most, if not all, future PCIe uh, add-in cards, at least for the near future and it's capable of delivering up to 600 watts. It could also be split into 150, 300, or 450 watts. In addition to that 12 plus 4 connector, Intel also updated the 12VO 2.0 spec to include a new I underscore PSU percent feature, which will allow the PSU to report the percentage of power being used. This is actually kind of cool. Intel said the following. It said that its new 12VH power connector includes sideband signals that will allow the power supply to communicate the power limit that it can provide to any PCIe Gen 5 card. It said that updated specifications include new DC output voltage regulation that'll be necessary for managing new power excursion requirements. And it says that the PSU percent feature provides benefits to small form factor systems specifically that can't employ larger power supplies. It also provides cost efficiencies for original equipment manufacturers as they are better able to right size PSU selection to meet system requirements. Up next, this one's really short. The RTX 3090 Ti cards are huge, very large. The EVGA one that we show in the teardown of the review, 3.5-ish slots. It's like some kind of cruel joke if you wanted to run them with NVLink. NVLink's basically dead at this point. But if you wanted to run them that way, the, the distance is like that between the two cards, which is just comical. Anyway, uh, we didn't see any images of 3090 Ti's before they came out. We just had the FTW3. Having now looked at them, they're all big. So it's something to be aware of anyway. Uh, they tend to be about 3.5 to 4 slots wide. Additionally, some of the liquid cooled SKUs that have leaked or now been formally shown, like the, the iGame Neptune, for example, appear to require fewer slots down to two. And open loop should be the same. So that may be kind of the way to go if you're buying one of these, but it hurts a little bit because you're spending so much on the card, adding a water block on top of that. It just It's like really driving the dagger into your wallet. But this would be the way to fit a lot of cards if you had to for some reason, like for a render farm or whatever. But anyway, uh, all the air-cooled SKUs are gigantic, and the price tag is too. So that's your follow-up on the 3090 Ti, now that we've seen other co coverage of it and cards launch. Finally, following Intel's recent news regarding the ATX 3.0 spec overhaul, 
FSP is among the first, if not the first, power supply vendor to get on board with ATX 3.0 compliance. FSP is also touting that it's working on products that are in compliance with PCIe Gen 5. In its press release, FSP makes note of the current situation whereby power supplies will need three 8-pin to 16-pin adapters to accommodate the new PCIe Gen 5 connector. So this is in FSP's Hydra series. We've actually requested some of these to run through our power supply testing suite, uh, just out of curiosity, really. But the new products are the Hydro G Pro. Those are in 850 watt, 1000 watt uh, units. And then the Hydro PTM or Platinum, G is gold, PTM is Platinum, Pro 850, 1000, and 1200 watt power supplies. All these will carry the new 12 plus 4 connector. It's a 16 pin connector and interface. And when FSP says interface, we think it's referring to the sensing logic required inside the power supply. These should be out soon. Some of the newer cards might be able to make use of these connectors, uh, but we are trying to get some in so that we can look at it and let you all know what we think and, and of course what you need to know going forward if it changes how you approach building a computer with high-end video cards. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab our toolkits that are in stock and shipping now. And you can also check out our GN Extras channel for some new videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.